like, okay, wait a second. Are you really starting, I'm going to be transparent, are you really starting the show talking about the Supreme Court and oral arguments on redistricting? Like, yeah, we are. And let me tell you why. Because this is a BFD, right? If you've been watching this show, if you've been watching any news, even like in your spare time over the last few years, you've heard a lot about why elections matter and why courts matter. And today, this is all coming together with arguments in this huge court case that could totally change how or if your vote is counted. I want to explain, right? Because we're talking about Moore v. Harper. It's a case based on something called the independent state legislature theory. I'm not going to ask you to memorize that or what that means. I'm going to boil it down to this one question. Here's what you need to know. The court's basically looking at, can the people who win elections decide how to run elections? The people who back this theory, which was once on the fringes of the far right, it's now endorsed by some Republicans and four sitting justices, they say, yeah, the state legislatures can do that, can basically cut out state courts altogether, something former President Trump wanted when he pushed lies about 2020 election fraud. But folks on the other side are like, wait a second, we have a system of checks and balances for a reason to put checks and create balances on stuff like this. They call it way too radical. North Carolina's governor saying this is a blatant misreading of the Constitution. The ACLU saying this would upend democracy. The Brennan Center for Justice calling it a fundamental shift to the way this country runs. Make no mistake, right? If the Supreme Court embraces this whole thing, it's going to mean a huge shift for the next election in 2024 and every single one after that. Kelly O'Donnell has been listening to arguments all day. And Kelly, this was on the merits, right? Because a couple of years Ago, the conservative justices didn't have the votes to even hear arguments about this theory. That was before we saw this conservative majority on the Supreme Court. Help us understand some of the tea leaves that we've seen in these oral arguments. Any clues to which way the court may be headed? Because as we're trying to convey to people, this stuff matters. Like, this matters if you care at all about the laws where you live. And the specific issues here in North Carolina didn't even exist a couple of years ago. This comes out of their redistricting where they created a map, the state legislators there, that the state Supreme Court threw out and replaced, used in this past midterm election. That's the basis of this. And interestingly, I sat through the three plus hours of the oral arguments today, and they did not really use the term independent state legislative theory, but they talked about what that means. That's sort of the outsider's view of that case. And what they're saying is that the Constitution gives state legislators all the power when it comes to deciding how elections run in our country. And those who believe in this theory say it should end there without that oversight of state courts. Uh, and that is a real problem for those who believe that there has to be that balance, that when uh, state lawmakers would gerrymander or have districts that are too far in one direction to favor one political party, that the courts have to be able to step in and balance that back. What we heard today from one of the liberal justices, Elena Kagan, is a concern about how the political process has to be measured here because lawmakers have their own interests. Here's Justice Kagan. Because legislators, we all know, have their own self-interest. They want to get reelected. And so there are countless times when they have incentives to suppress votes, to dilute votes, to negate votes, to prevent um, voters from having true access and true opportunity to engage the political process. And she was one of the liberal justices who was talking about the real world, big implications if the court were to side with North Carolina on this. Justice Alito, one of the conservatives, though, also pointed out that in some states, the state Supreme Court is itself elected and can have political influences. So there was a real push and pull here. This was uh, of the cases I've been sitting through, uh, Hallie, this one was really a law school class. And there was a real tug of war here over some key issues. And it was hard to discern where the justices are on certain things. But when you look at Justice Thomas and Justice Alito and Justice yeah. Gorsuch, they seem most sympathetic to this idea coming from North Carolina. Well, well that's what I was going to ask, right? And, and from the, the lawyers who are arguing on both sides of this, what's the vibe check, Kel, on that front? Well, they, those conservative justices definitely saw some merit about how the Constitution does give this power to legislators. But you also heard Ketanji Brown-Jackson, the newest justice, say that implicit in that was that 
the states give this power to lawmakers knowing that built in are constraints like the courts, like a governor who has veto power. Today, we also heard from North Carolina's Speaker of the House. Uh, his name is Morris, and that and his he is named for the case uh, because he's the Speaker of the House. And here's how he responded when he had a chance to talk after the arguments. I don't know where this, this thing of this independent state legislature theory comes from. It shouldn't be up to, to judges or bureaucrats. It should be up to the people through their elected representatives in the legislature. And so one of the concerns people have is that if you take this theory and if it were to be supported by the court, that it could open the door to things like, could state legislators throw out electors? That's what we had heard about uh, with some of the Trump allies in 2020, uh, nullifying what voters said and replacing them when it comes to validating a presidential election. Or could they ignore other key things with respect to the rights of individual citizens? Well, some of the discussion today was, yeah. well, there are other federal laws that could intervene there. So this is complicated, but on both sides, it was very clear that this could have big implications for how American democracy works That's, in a very yes. practical sense. I, and like, you know what, Kelly? Can I just, I don't think we should shy away from news that is complicated. Every, people are smart. You get it, and um, we get it, and they get it, and I appreciate that. I, I appreciate enjoyed your listening to it because it was, it was a lot to chew on today. I love it. Kelly O'Donnell, thank you, friend. Appreciate it. Let's take a look at what else is going down the other end, actually not too far from where Kelly is on the Hill, because I want to show you here the moment that Senator Raphael Warnock came back rather triumphantly to the U.S. Capitol today to meet with Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, celebrating his big win over Herschel Walker in that Georgia Senate runoff. All smiles. That is not surprising. Democrats are thrilled. Republicans are not so thrilled with this blame game beginning. I want to tell you what Senator Mitt Romney had to say literally in the last couple of minutes about Republicans' defeat in this Georgia race. Watch. Well, President Trump lost again. Uh, and I know a lot of people in our party uh, love the president, former president. But he said, uh, uh, if you will, the kiss of death for somebody who wants to win a general election. The kiss of death. We're going to talk more about that in a second. And if you're like, well, wait a second, why? Look at this, right? This is how badly the former president's candidates, people he wanted to win, this is how they did in key swing states won by President Biden, 2024 battlegrounds. Just two of his 14 endorsements for governor, Senate, or secretary of state races actually came out on top. Right? These are in tough races. Shaq Brewster, Shaquille Brewster is joining us now from Atlanta. And Shaq, um, let me start, I guess, with the sort of celebration from Democrats, and we'll talk to you about the, the frustration from re Republicans. Um, they are thrilled, Democrats are, because to them, this is going to make a lot of things a lot easier for them in a 51 to 49 Senate. And let me just remind people, this was not a race that determined whether Democrats would control the Senate. We knew they would. Right. This was a race that's going to give them a little bit of a cushion so that if, like, something goes down, they're not totally in trouble with their legislative priorities. Meaning like somebody gets sick or a centrist right. Democrat decides they want to vote with Republicans. Sounds like you might be talking about Joe Manchin, Hallie. <laughs> but I think when you saw that video with Chuck Schumer and uh, Raphael Warnock on the steps of the Capitol, I think the only person more excited than Senator Warnock winning his election last night is Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. You saw him on the steps of the Capitol there, but Schumer actually met Warnock at the car, at the uh, door to his car, and had this big grin on his face. You see the relief there, and a lot of it has to do with how much easier it makes his job at this point. Listen to what we heard from the Majority Leader explaining the impact of this uh, Senate win. It's been amazing how Republicans have been able to use the 50-50 Senate to procedurally hold up so many appointments. It's going to be a lot quicker, swifter, and easier. So you're looking at more nominations, you're looking at legislation, at least getting passed in the Senate a little bit more easily than in the past. Remember, there's still Republicans who will have control over the House, so uh, that doesn't necessarily mean more legislation will land on President Biden's desk. But Democrats surely celebrating what they saw last night. Yeah, at one point you saw um, Senator Schumer earlier holding up 5-1 because of his 51-seat majority there. Let me talk about Republicans. There it is. Because... Um, you had, for example, John Thune, key member of leadership, talking about how Donald Trump is an albatross around the neck of Republicans in these tough races. What was clear from what we saw in Georgia, 
at least in this runoff, and it put a button on it, is that the Trump brand is toxic in some of these important states. And I say that because Raphael Warnock's win doesn't mean that, like, Georgia is suddenly a big blue state. It's sure not, right? Look at who won key statewide races there. Um, a whole bunch of Republicans who have repudiated Donald Trump for his election fraud lies. We're looking now at Metro Atlanta, where uh, Senator Warnock overperformed, and what a huge shift, a huge swing there has been on that front from John Kerry. I think we showed it. John Kerry back in 2004, Democrats swinging 42 points in some of these key suburbs. That is what matters because those voters in those metro suburbs, Shaq, uh, seem to be, and we have data points to back this up, the data shows they are turned off by Donald Trump. That is going to matter in 2024 for Republicans. Without a doubt. And that's why, yes, you had Mitt Romney saying uh, Trump was a kiss of death. But if you look and listen to what we heard from senators on the Hill earlier today, not all Republican senators are saying it's a Trump factor there. Some of them are saying that it's about candidate quality, ignoring the fact that Herschel Walker was Donald Trump's hand Trump. candidate. Some of them are saying it's about fun exactly, exactly. And some of them are saying it's about fundraising. Others are saying uh, it's just about the demographic shifts that you're seeing in this state. Yes. You saw in those county results, Raphael Warnock really take advantage of the trends that you've been seeing in the state of Georgia. But many of the people, voters I've been talking to, they acknowledge that uh, Warnock, they, they, while the Democrats like Warnock, they did have some problems with um, Herschel Walker. I want you to listen to a sample of the conversations I've been having. I don't think so. I mean, it makes sense to need to be able to have an ID. Just because there's been record voting doesn't mean that there's not still some voter suppression. Um, the two things are not related. And separate from Trump, as you hear in that conversation, is the conversation over whether or not voter suppression exists in this state, despite the fact that you had Raphael Warnock pull out that victory last night. Shaq Brewster, live first there in Atlanta, uh, a man of the people at the grocery store where you're finding folks who are going out for their evening uh, uh, meal. Thank you very much, Shaq. Appreciate it. We want to get to some breaking news out of Florida tonight because NBC News is now learning that a couple of documents marked classified were found in a federal storage facility that also had some other items belonging to former President Trump. Two people familiar with the matter say they were found during a voluntary search of a bunch of Trump properties, a search conducted by Mr. Trump's own attorneys, who then turned these documents over to the FBI. The FBI has declined to comment. Joining us now is Ken Delaney. And Ken, just to be like very clear for people, this is all part and parcel um, of the story related to Mr. Trump's handling of classified documents. The documents found in the storage unit, they are separate from what we already know was found at Mar-a-Lago, which seems to suggest that this went beyond simply the former president's current home, that there were documents in other places, sensitive governmental materials that seem to have not been handled appropriately here. Talk us through what you're learning. Yeah, that's correct, Tally. And just to be clear, one of the sources told us that these materials went to this storage unit and Donald Trump never touched them or saw them. They were in a box, uh, ostensibly coming right from the White House, and they, there they sat. But it shows, again, that uh, after the Trump team got a grand jury subpoena in May asking for all documents marked classified in their possession, they did not turn them all over, whether through incompetence or for some other reason. And what's interesting about this is now it's very clear that Trump lawyers are trying to demonstrate to the Justice Department that they're making a good faith effort to search various premises to make sure that there are no classified documents remaining. But it's unclear to me how the Justice Department could trust that, given that their lawyers, his lawyers, made the same representation uh, a while ago. And then the FBI searched Mar-a-Lago and found hundreds of classified documents. And so it's a cat and mouse game here. What's also interesting is, look, if the FBI had a probable cause to believe that uh, evidence of a crime was at these other Trump properties, Bedminster or Trump Tower in New York, they would execute a search warrant. And they haven't done that. But at the same time, here you go with two documents marked classified turning up in a storage unit containing other Trump uh, memorabilia. Uh, it just shows that this Mar-a-Lago saga is ongoing, Hallie. It also seems to suggest, Ken, that even if, I mean, setting aside whether the former president knew or did not know about this, and it sounds like from your reporting, a source is telling you he wasn't even aware of this, 
these things, these sensitive documents, there are not, I mean, there are protocols for handling them, are there not, right? I mean, there are ways that these kinds of documents and materials should be handled that have been handled in other White Houses that, by based on this reporting, seem to have not been done in this instance, right? Do we know anything more about that? Could there be more, given that there are potentially other places that could have been searched by the Trump team? In theory, there could. Now, uh, the, the sources are saying that these searches took place and only two documents were turned over. So the implication there is they didn't find others. But yeah. you, you raised a really great point, Allie. This is a big deal. This is not normal. Even two documents marked classified contained in a storage facility, which is not uh, which is not designed to handle state secrets, is a big deal. People have gone to jail for less. We get, we get a little numb because, you know, Trump took hundreds of classified documents, and they found so many at his Mar-a-Lago property. But even these two is a big deal. And again, once again, it shows that the Trump team did not comply with a grand jury subpoena, which is also a very big deal, very serious matter, Hallie. Any sense of timeline on when we may see whether or not the DOJ could take action against the former president or his team for the way that they've handled classified docs? Or am I shouting questions into the void that are simply unanswerable? <sighs> No, well, I think the only thing that's safe to say is the timeline on this investigation is much more accelerated than, say, the January 6th investigation. There, we, we should see some, some denouement within the next few months, presumably. Legal experts who are looking at this think that this is a case that other people already would have been charged, Sally. Ken Delaney, and live for us there at the Department of Justice. Ken, thank you. To China's extraordinary shift now and very controversial pivot on their zero COVID strategy that is raising new questions about what this means globally for the virus and what this means for the pandemic overall. Right now in China, if you have a mild or asymptomatic COVID case, you can isolate at home. You do not have to go to quarantine facilities like you used to have to do just recently. Very strict testing requirements for some spots are gonna be dropped. Whole city blocks will not be shut down if cases pop up, like on a floor of an apartment building. Again, this, this sounds like you're probably like, well, yeah, duh, how? But like, this is what was happening in China before this. Why is this happening? The economy, right? The amount of stuff that China is sending to other countries is dropping. They're sending less stuff at a really fast rate. It's gonna hurt the chances for a quick recovery economically for China. Plus, there have been weeks of protests like these that you see on your screen, demanding that the government ease up on restrictions. Now the shift from China is raising questions about the potential unpredictability of what this means globally for the pandemic. And it comes as America's top infectious disease doctor here in the U.S., Anthony Fauci, is sitting down exclusively with our own Lester Holt, talking about what he thinks, where he thinks the pandemic is going, and the politicization of it here in the United States. We're going to have more on that in a second with our Mike Memoli outside the White House. But let's start with Janice Mackey Freyer in Beijing. And Janice, um, it's a pivot. It just is. And it, it answers a question that we had been asking previously when we saw these extraordinary demonstrations, which is, what is Xi Jinping going to do? We now know. We are seeing it start to play out today. The question is, what's next? Well, for three years, Zero COVID has been tightening its control over every aspect of daily life here. It's the data surveillance, it's the mandatory testing, the lockdowns, the quarantines. It's the really excessive aspects like the ban on buying over-the-counter medicines like cough syrup and ibuprofen because of the potential uh, that they could mask COVID systems, uh, symptoms. So uh, the government now willing to walk away from all of this. Uh, these changes were likely to happen anyway. The policy was uh, seen as unsus unsustainable, but they do come after extraordinary protests here uh, that called for an end to zero COVID uh, and then grew into calls for greater political freedoms here. And that seems to be what has forced the hand of President Xi Jinping in making these concessions. Uh, zero COVID is his signature policy. Even a few weeks ago, he was talking talking about uh, battling the virus in war terms and saying that China was going to stick to it. Uh, but it seems that it's now willing to dismantle at least part of the system and, and replace it with something else as people head into this next phase of the pandemic. The economic consideration is huge here. What does this mean for the supply chain globally? How might it affect People in the U.S. who buy things, Apple, for example, had looked at moving some of their manufacturing outside of China because of these lockdowns. They had said iPhone shipments could be delayed. You know, now that China's opening back up, what does this mean for people, you know, who are looking at, like, the supply chain crisis we've seen over the last year, you know, since the pandemic started? 
Though there's no doubt that uh, confidence in China's supply chain, chain has taken a serious hit, uh, losing its luster as the, the world's so-called factory floor. Supply chains thrive on predictability, and zero COVID has guaranteed anything but, with the snap lockdowns and the heavy restrictions uh, having an impact not only on production and output, but also uh, shipping and deliveries. Everything delayed down the line. Some of the uh, more um, violent protests uh, that we saw, the more um, uh, harsh lashing out, uh, was in Guangzhou and Guangdong province. This is a manufacturing hub in yeah. China. Um, they had been seriously hurt uh, by the lockdowns as well. Uh, the lockdown in Shanghai uh, having a serious impact on the automotive industry. Uh, so there is the sense that while the government is making these moves to make people's lives better, <clears throat> it is also to release the chokehold uh, that zero COVID has had on the economy. Janice, real quick, talk about some of the social media reaction, because it seems like there's a sense of relief, but in some corners almost ambivalent. I'm always curious. You, you know, people know that you live in China, right? Your family is there. You're living this alongside your neighbors, et cetera. What, what's the feeling there about this move? Well, of course, everybody is happy to, to have these harsher aspects of the system lifted, but it now introduces and invites a new set of anxieties. Uh, for the most part, people here don't have a lot of experience uh, with COVID, and now they're having to confront it directly. We've had restrictions relaxed before, but the difference now is that with this opening up, there's actually a lot of COVID here now. So infections are going to go up. Uh, people aren't really prepared. There's been a run on cold medications at pharmacies tonight, um, and the healthcare system really wow. has had no stress test for the wave of cases that's coming, Hallie. Janice mackey Frayer, thank you. I know you'll keep us updated. Appreciate it. We mentioned how Lester Holt sat down with some of Dr. Anthony Fauci talking about the pandemic and talking about the politicization of COVID, too, reflecting on some of the very heated exchanges that he had with Republican Senator Rand Paul when he was doing these congressional hearings, thinking about one in particular. Watch. You got angry at times in some of the, the congressional hearings when you were personally attacked. Do you have any regrets about the way that you handled that? Um, I think 99.9% .9 of the time, I have been my usual self, which is very calm and measured. The only time I really got upset was when Senator Paul totally inappropriately on national TV that was following that hearing accused me of being responsible for the death of five million people. Now, with all due respect, I'm not going to take that from anybody, including a senator. Mike Memley is live for us now outside the White House. As Dr. Fauci, Mem, is departing his role, we know this, he is leaving public service, um, at least in this fashion. We're talking about COVID right now, right? Because while people are largely, I think in many ways, in many places, living life, m sort of moving on past the pandemic, thousands of people are still getting sick. The White House has launched a six-week push for people to get the booster. Um, but when you look at some of the numbers, there's not like a ton of people getting the shot. They're seeing these numbers, right? I mean, they know that this is the reality. Yeah, and Hallie, to be perfectly blunt about it, this six-week push that was announced a couple weeks ago was more about messaging than really substance. A lot of the things they announced that were going into the six-week push, like you know, pop-up vaccination clinics, more ad spending to try to promote the booster, uh, and even you know things just like uh, making the availability more with par partnerships at pharmacies were things that had already been set into motion you know, all at this point. And so this was more about uh, giving Anthony Fauci a reason to go into the briefing room and give him a nice send off a couple weeks ago than reality. But as I've been talking to White House officials, they, they see those numbers that you just put up, 39 million Americans who have gotten that booster, the uh, uh, Omicron specific booster. And they say, listen, it's not exactly where we want to be, but it's more progress than I think they had expected at this point. And the other thing they point to is Look, at we're now heading into the third holiday season in the COVID era. And if you look at the mortality rates right around the holidays two years ago and a year ago, they were much higher than where they are right now. So they think that the larger COVID strategy that this president has undertaken uh, has been successful. And it's a reason why we're seeing far fewer deaths at this point, even as some uh, cases, case levels are rising around the country. Mike Memoli, thank you for that. Appreciate it. You can watch more of Lester's interview with Dr. Fauci tonight on Nightly News, 630 Eastern, wherever and however you are watching your local NBC station.
Some news developing late this afternoon with two states going after TikTok now, the Chinese app that you are probably scrolling on, maybe even as you're watching the show right now. It's super popular, but now Indiana is filing two lawsuits today. One, saying TikTok is misleading kids onto the platform. Second, says TikTok is deceiving users into thinking their personal data is being protected from the Chinese government and Communist Party. This is the first suit we believe that a state has filed against TikTok that has this kind of uh, accusation, if you will, that reaches this level. You've also got Texas Governor Greg Abbott today saying TikTok is now banned on any government issues, phones, laptops, and tablets because of the threat of China getting access to U.S. info. TikTok has repeatedly denied that any American's data is sent to the Chinese government. Perry Russell is joining us now. What's interesting here, Perry, you know, I live in Washington. I cover Congress and the White House and all that. There's been a lot of talk from a lot of Republicans, some Democrats, about concerns over TikTok. We've covered it a lot on this show in the building down the street from me at the Capitol. What you are seeing now tonight is a state looking to take legal action against the company. Uh, who knows if it's going to be a tipping point or a turning point, but it does feel significant at this moment. It feels like what we're starting to see is pressure build against TikTok and its parent company, ByteDance. This is the lawsuit you're mentioning. It's 55 pages long. It is quite massive here. State of Indiana versus TikTok and ByteDance. Hallie, listen to the first line. TikTok Inc. is a Chinese Trojan horse unleashed on unsuspecting American consumers who have been misled by the company's false representations about the content on its platform. This lawsuit from Indiana specifically focuses on children. This is what it says here in the lawsuit, that the TikTok algorithm promotes a variety of inappropriate content to 13 to 17 year olds throughout the U.S. depicting alcohol, tobacco, drug use, sexual content, nudity, suggestive themes. They talk about the hashtag devious licks, that TikTok trend where kids were recording videos of themselves and posting online where they were stealing things from their schools. They were breaking things. And essentially what this prayer for relief, as it says here in the lawsuit, what they want is they want TikTok to stop treating users unfairly, and they also want $5,000 for each state violation that TikTok, they say, has committed. TikTok has, as we said, long said that, listen, they have protections in place, that they have protections for U.S. users um, against any sort of Chinese accessing of their data. What are we hearing from the company, if anything, tonight? What's the expectation? So nothing yet from TikTok. This lawsuit just came down at, what, 1244 p.m. in Allen County, Indiana. We are reaching out to TikTok to get some response from them. But pressure surely is building. You mentioned yeah. Texas as well. But it's not just Texas that is doing this, right? Last week, South Dakota did a similar thing, banning TikTok for government workers. And they cited a national security threat. And then yesterday, Maryland and South Carolina, Hallie, they stopped all access to TikTok on government phones and devices, Hallie. Perry, Russ, I'm really glad to have you on with this, with this one. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Coming up, officials in Germany arresting dozens of people accused of plotting to overthrow the government. What we know about the suspects. Plus, there may be some good news on the California drought coming from the mountains. We're going to explain when we get back. The mountains in California getting slammed with some major snow. And typically when we're talking about big blizzards, we're telling you about like gloom and doom, right? The potentially dangerous pieces of it. In this instance, it happens to be a glimmer of hope for California because look at this map. Basically the entire state is in some kind of a drought condition. Some parts in an exceptional drought. So the state needs all the rain and snow it can get. And yes, I know it's December. We expect to see snow. But the snow we're seeing now is blowing past averages for right now. Skiers obviously are thrilled. Look at these percentages. Northern and central Sierras are at about 165% of the average. And the southern Sierra is up more than 200%. Let's bring in our meteorologist, Bill Karens. Um, not bad if you yeah. like to, you know, crush some slopes. I don't know, like whatever skiers <laughs> say. But, like, yes. you know, the, 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 the bigger impact is really the fact that California needs snowfall because it impacts their water cycle for the summer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's a cycle here. Yeah, uh, the, the skiers, the snowboarders love the powder, but everyone also likes to water their lawns. I think that's pretty much the point that we you know, won't want to make. And uh, have you ever heard of the Snow Lab? So there's actually a research facility that's up in Donner Pass, really high elevations, and this is a picture of it. And this is, they've been measuring snow here since 1946, almost going on 80 years. And so we get all of our main statistics from them. They keep track of other observation sites within the state too. And as of today, they're saying they're about 212% of 
average for snow. So California does things a little weird. They have a, what they call their rainy season, their water year. It starts October 1st, and that's when the beginning is. We're only two months into it. So we're above average. They don't go by a calendar year because their rainy season and snowy season actually is mostly in the winter, so they don't want to divide it up because, you know, it's going, you know, obviously November, December, and they don't want to separate, you know, wet January and February. So it doesn't really matter how much snow is on the ground. It matters when we melt the snow, how much water is in that. So we call that liquid equivalent, and that's actually good. This has been like a heavy, wet snowpack, so it's 281% of normal. So we have to get that in those reservoirs, and the reservoirs are the key here. And we have a graphic to show you this. 34%, um, that's how filled right now the current level is of the California reservoirs. So of all the reservoirs and all the water it could potentially hold in California, we're only at a third. So we need about 10 winters in a row, like the one we've just started with this above average snowfall, to start making it back up towards what would be the historical average for this time of year, which is about 63%. So we're happy we're getting it. We're about, you know, we've been way too dry, though, for about 20 years. And here's the great news, Hallie. I mean, we have a huge storm coming for the West this upcoming weekend. Again, horrible for travel in the mountains, but we are going to see people getting 46, 32, 29 inches of snow, three to five feet in the mountains they've had 50 inches in the last seven days alone and the weekend the week outlook for all of next week we're going to stay cold with some periods of snow so all the way up through about christmas hallie uh things are looking great for the west it's been a perfect start but i'll leave you with this last year we also had a good start and then january february march last year was the driest ever yeah. we can't have it cut off like that again this year Bill Karens, thank you. It's fascinating to look at. We're going to see how it goes the rest of the uh, rainy season, if you will, there in California. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, German officials arresting more than two dozen people suspected of planning to violently overthrow the government in a far-right extremist plot. More than 3,000 police officers were involved in those raids early this morning. No word on the suspects' names yet, but they apparently include a nobleman with a historic royal title and some armed forces veterans. The suspects expected to appear in court later this week. Number two, North Carolina officials are announcing a reward just now of up to $75,000 for information leading to the arrest of whoever is responsible for destroying some power substations in Moore County. Remember, intentionally done, according to officials there. All of the damaged equipment has been fixed. Duke Energy says customers who have been without power for days should have it back by midnight tonight. Instead of big impact, schools had been shut down. Still no suspects, but keep in mind DHS had issued a broad warning about potential attacks on infrastructure late last month. Number three, Sonny Balwani, the former business partner of Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes, just sentenced to 13 years in prison. Earlier this year, he was found guilty on 12 fraud charges. Prosecutors wanted him to get at least 15 years. Elizabeth Holmes has had 11 for misleading investors and consumers about the company's blood testing technology. And before, a lot of division in this world, but something that unites many of us, obsession with Wordle. So popular, Wordle is, that it's the top searched word on Google, more than Ukraine, more than the queen. You're seeing Wordle here. You have six chances to figure out whatever the five-letter word of the day is. Number five, Time Magazine named Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky and the spirit of Ukraine as its 2022 Person of the Year. The Ukrainian leader has gotten praise from world leaders and Ukrainian citizens about how he handles Russia's war, the invasion of his country, even though Zelensky had no prior military experience. When we come back. Study out in just the last couple of minutes here shows doctors may have a revolutionary new way to fight melanoma a notoriously tough cancer to treat. This research finds there's a new type of therapy that actually delays the progress of advanced melanoma better than what's out there now. It's a cell therapy called TIL. So in this new trial, they gave it to patients, about 170 of them. The patients that got this new TIL therapy saw a 50% drop in the progression of the disease. 20% of these patients saw their tumors disappear altogether. Dr. John Torres joins us now. And Dr. Torres, given, you know, Dr. John, given how tough melanoma is to treat, this feels like a big step forward compared to what's out there. 
And Hallie, this is a big step forward for a couple reasons. Number one, when you look at melanoma, what's happened over the last decade or so, as a decade ago, the five-year survival rate was only around 5%. We've had immunotherapies come across here, and now that rate's jumped up to about 50%. But this is essentially turbocharging it. And the reason we need this to happen and have even more survival behind this is because we are still seeing this year, they estimate, around 100,000 cases of a metastatic melanoma and between seven and 8,000 people dying because of it. So it's still out there, still causing issues and having this treatment here, which is an immunotherapy treatment, but a very specialized type of treatment where they get the, the lymphocytes, the immune cells that are attacking a the tumor. They're not doing a very good job. They take them into the laboratory. They pull them from the person's blood, take them in the laboratory. They basically produce many more of those, give them back to the person's body, and then they can fight this. And again, that's the turbocharging behind the immune system here. This is a huge advancement in treatment of melanoma, and they are looking right now at seeing what's going to happen over the next few years as more and more people get this. And that's the timeline, right, is years, not months, because it's going to take a minute for this to become mainstream for people, right? Exactly. When right now, Inovance, the company that has developed this, is applying for the FDA BLA, which is the approval process. And we saw during the pandemic, and we talked a lot about this, the approval process can take up to six, eight months. And so they're applying. They'll give the information to the FDA. The FDA will ask their questions, and then they'll get it, and then it'll become treatment. So hopefully, by later of 2023, we'll start seeing this thing be produced and more people being able to get it. Dr. John Torres, thank you so much, Dr. John. Good to see you on this uh, glimmer of hope for people who are struggling, of course, with melanoma diagnoses. Right now, doctors and pharmacists in Ohio are warning they're in the middle of a real Tamiflu shortage, as we're seeing people get sent to the hospital for the flu at the highest level in 10 years. You probably know Tamiflu, right? You pop it in your mouth, you get it for the flu or for RSV or something like that, some sort of respiratory infection. But because the flu came a lot earlier this year, the treatments become hard to find. And this kind of shortage is not just happening in Ohio. It's happening across the country with some other drugs, too. Jesse Kirsch has more. Hallie, at least one health system near Cincinnati telling us that they are seeing localized shortages of Tamiflu. And this is coming as we continue to see the virus surging across much of the country. Public health officials in Cincinnati say they are seeing what they call a, quote, strong early flu season. And we asked them about Tamiflu supply, and they told us that in part in a statement, quote, while the supply of Tamiflu has been lower than usual, most people with the prescription have been able to find a local pharmacy with it in stock. Our Chicago station, WMAQ, says that CVS told them in part, quote, while we're not experiencing a widespread shortage of Tamiflu at this time, we are seeing increased demand at our stores nationwide and sporadic shipping from select manufacturers, adding, in part, there will be increased instances when individual pharmacies could be temporarily out of stock. WMAQ reports that Walgreens also said that there are, quote, temporary and isolated shortages of Tamiflu at its pharmacies. That healthcare system near Cincinnati says that it is prioritizing giving Tamiflu to patients who, quote, are at higher risk of influenza complications who have symptoms less than 48 hours. That medical team recommending you go to the emergency room if you experience symptoms including shortness of breath, chest pain, confusion, or if you're feeling lethargic. There is another medication that St. Elizabeth Healthcare, the team in the Cincinnati area that we spoke with, referred to. But that medication can be quite pricey, they say, around $160 to $180 for the single dose needed. It is also something that that team says should not be prescribed to pregnant women. So obviously, the options uh, can be somewhat limited in this space. Public health officials recommending that some of the best things you can do to protect yourself, get vaccinated, practice good hygiene, and if you are not feeling well, stay home. Hallie? Or Jesse Kirsch reporting for us there. Coming up here on the show, new federal court documents say the leader of a small polygamous group had at least 20 wives, many of them minors. Why two of those supposed wives were in court today. Plus, San Francisco officials slamming the brakes on a policy that would have let police robots use deadly force, that whole killer robot thing you've been hearing about. More on that coming up in the local. Today, two of the roughly 20 wives of a polygamous leader set to appear in federal court on a hearing involving charges of obstruction and kidnapping of eight of Bateman's, Samuel Bateman's alleged so-called child brides from Arizona authorities. We're talking about a family with at least 20 wives based on the Arizona-Utah border. 
according to an FBI court document. Earlier in the year, nine girls were taken into custody by Arizona's Department of Child Services. Eight of them ran away from group homes. Last week in Washington state, a police officer spotted a vehicle with the eight missing girls being driven by another of Bateman's wives. Court documents filed by the FBI say Samuel Bateman was a member of the FLDS Church, an offshoot of the Mormon Church, who started his own polygamous group and is a self-proclaimed prophet and alleges he participated in sexual acts with his followers and minor children. NBC News has reached out to Bateman's attorneys for comments. Joining us now is Danny Savalos. The uh, her horrific sort of charges here, and just to note, you know, there, there is no, it's, it's rape with a minor. Um, and Bateman here, court doc outlined by the FBI, shares the justification for the kidnapping and obstruction charges for these wives. Walk us through it. Two counts, obstruction and kidnapping. The obstruction relates, relates primarily to deleting or removing evidence, uh, and that is exactly what they would charge for obstruction, whether it be deleting stuff from a signal uh, app or whatever the communications may be. The kidnapping charge is one of the original bases for jurisdiction for the federal government uh, because it involves moving people across state lines. So both of these uh, pretty serious charges, especially the kidnapping, maybe somewhat less so the obstruction charge, Charges, but uh, the kidnapping charges, very, very serious crimes. And look, this seems to be right out of the, the DOJ's playbook. They're going to hit these people with uh, kidnapping charges, possibly get them to turn and cooperate against the primary target, uh, which is likely the leader of this sect. What are the, um, how did this story get on the Fed's radar? How did this whole issue get on the Fed's radar in the first place? Well, according to the complaint, I mean, they were, they were looking at a number of different people, uh, a number of different uh, wives and people that were, you know, uh, uh, allegedly, and everything here is alleged, but, you know, wives that had been taken in or men that had sort of given their wives to this leader. And uh, from there, it sort of blossomed into a rather large investigation of many potential daughter slash child wives uh, that, I mean, that is really concerning at this point. In terms of maximum penalties, uh, the kidnapping charges carry with statutory maximum of 20 years. So uh, these are very, very serious. I can't say that enough. Danny Savalos, thank you so much. Appreciate it. NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day. And because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. At our West Coast Bureau, San Francisco supervisors voted to slam the brakes on a controversial policy that would have pol let police use basically killer robots. Robots, basically, that had deadly force. It's a reversal of a plan approved just last week that got a lot of pushback. Police wanted to give officers the ability to use possibly lethal robots in emergency situations. From our Southeast Bureau, an 18-year-old in Arkansas making history in a runoff election last night, Jalen Smith now becomes the youngest black mayor in the country. He just graduated from Earl High School back in May. He's now going to be the city's new leader, the mayor-elect, pledging to improve public safety, tear down abandoned homes, and bring public transportation to town. Out of our Northeast Bureau, something that looks like, I don't know, a, a little bit of a cartoon because it's a black bear in Connecticut that's just going to hibernate out in a tree in somebody's backyard. The owner of the house is reportedly trying to evict her new tenant, but some people in the area say they're enjoying their new neighbor who's just trying to take a snooze, do a little hibernating for the winter. We had to do a fourth local here because we also got an update from our Southeast Bureau. Archaeologists think they've figured out what erosion exposed on a Florida beach. They say it's a shipwreck with a wooden hull, probably a merchant ship, maybe dating back centuries. Researchers don't want to dig it up or anything because the ship wouldn't survive that. Archaeologists plan to document their findings and then rebury it. A little bit of breaking news to share with you here with two sources telling NBC News that the January 6th committee is looking at the week before Christmas to release its final report. And specifically, apparently, they're looking at December 21st. They're warning the schedule is not final yet, but they think that's the earliest they can get all this stuff done. It's a little later, I think, than the committee had originally hoped, according to this reporting, but they want to get the physical production of the report ready, like printing it off, et cetera. They're planning to release it as part of what they're calling a public business meeting, no more details from a spokesperson on that, but it is interesting. It is a mark your calendars kind of moment here. We'll see you in the morning. We'll see you tomorrow because that's a wrap for this hour. More same time, same place, 24 hours from now. More coverage picks up right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.